This week has been kind of, um, actually the past month has been kind of a revival for me. I feel like in the spirit, there's been a revival taking place within my life. And I, I feel like this word is going to speak to somebody tonight. And I was just filled with joy when I got home from work today. I was praying to God and I was just, man, I was just, I felt a burden and I felt a joy at the same time. I was just so happy because of what God has done in my life. And I'm thinking over and over about God's grace over my life. And uh, it kind of gets me emotional to think about where God has taken me from the man that I was years ago and to where I am today. It's, you wouldn't be able to recognize him. You wouldn't recognize me if you knew me eight years ago. You wouldn't. And um, I'm a testimony of God's grace and power in somebody's life. I'm a testimony, come on somebody, of God's power, of God's grace. But I'm not alone. Hallelujah. Look at your brother and sister and tell them, you know what, you're a testimony too. You're a testimony of God's grace and power. Tonight, if you're looking for a title for this message, I entitled it, His Grace is Power. But before we get into the word, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just come before you, God. We pray that you would, Lord, just remove me, Father God. Let your spirit take control. Let your spirit take over tonight, Lord God. Whatever you want to do, Father, let it be done, Father God. Lord, let me be separated, be put to the side, Lord God, and let your Holy Spirit take control tonight, Father, in the name of Jesus. We want... Lord God, to have our hearts sensitive and soft tonight, Lord, to what you want to do and what you want to say, Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen and amen. Come on, look to your neighbor and say, His grace is power. The Bible in the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 1, if you can turn there for me, please. I've just been uh, thinking about God's grace throughout the week in my in my own life, and it just it baffles me. You know, it it surprises me when you think about what kind of God we serve. When you think about who God is, have you ever thought of that? Have you ever sat down and taken some time to think about who God is, what He's done, what He's created? I I think about these things and they blow my mind. I'll sit on my couch, and I'll think about God. Does anybody still do that nowadays? Do they still think about God? Do they still contemplate who God is? Do they still contemplate how powerful, how awesome, how magnificent God is? I don't know about you, but I think about that sometimes. I think about how great and how awesome he is and how big he is and how powerful he is. I'm not just... I'm not just spitting words. I'm telling you the truth tonight. God is great and awesome. And we have to understand what kind of God he is. And when I think of God's grace, I can't think of anyone better to talk about than the Apostle Paul. You know, in 1 Timothy, it says in chapter 1, verse 15, here is a, trust, a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. God's grace is patience. God's grace is patience. It's him waiting on you. Isn't that wild? It's God waiting for his people to turn away from sin. It's God's grace. It's his patience for his people to turn their own lives around, to figure out the faults that are in their lives, to evaluate their hearts, to think about what's in their own, the contents of their own hearts. It's God's grace and patience that we're saved today because before we got saved, we weren't thinking about God. We weren't thinking about the Lord. We weren't thinking about how we could live a godly life. We were thinking about how we could get our next fix, our next drink, how we could come up, how we could hit a lick. Come on, somebody. We weren't thinking about God at all. 
But God was there patiently waiting. Oh, come on, somebody. He was there patiently waiting. Why? Because he chose us. Because he set us free and he decided, you know what, I'm going to use somebody like you and like me to do something great for his honor and glory. And Pastor Paul, he did, that was the exact same thing that God did with him. He waited patiently. Paul or Saul at that time, growing up, learning the law, studying under uh, certain uh, priests, you know, learning the, the Hebrew law, the Torah, reading it every day, reciting it. Those years of him being in school with the top teachers, God was sitting there waiting. Even while he persecuted Christians, even while he spoke with evil intent in his heart, God was still waiting there. And then at that, there was a specific time where God decided to kick him off of his high horse. Come on, does anybody relate to that tonight where God decided, you know what, I'm going to interrupt your miserable life. I'm going to do something supernatural within you. I'm going to give you a God-sized encounter. I'm going to show you a revelation of who I am so that you could do something great for me. That's what God did for Saul. It says in Acts 9, chapter, chapter 9, verse 1 through 6. Excuse me. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus. Look at how determined Saul was. Look at how determined he was, how, how pushed he was towards persecuting these people, how, how fully believed he was, how fully indebted he was to this belief that he had that Christianity was a lie, that this so-called Jesus was a nobody. He was so invested in his belief. Come on, we need some people like that in our church today that are so invested, that are so indebted. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't know where I would be without this ministry. They were talking about it on Saturday or, or sorry, Wednesday. They were talking about how they wouldn't know where they'd be if it wasn't for Victory Outreach. They wouldn't know where it would where they would be if it wasn't for a ministry that chose to, ch to use people like you and I, of a ministry that chose to see something within you and I. I don't know about you, but I feel a burden in my heart to say that tonight. That God desires for us to understand that he sees something within us as well. Saul was right there. He was right there. He was breathing those murderous threats, but God was waiting patiently. As he neared Damascus on his journey, it says, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he said, who are you, Lord? Saul asked, I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. He replied, and that probably blew him off of his back right there. He was like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> what am I doing? And he says, now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Because within Saul's heart, he believed that only God could do something like this. That this had to be a work of God. You being here tonight has to be a work of God. You being in a certain place and circumstance within your life is a work from God. Why? So that he could gain the glory from it. So that he could, he could spend his grace upon your life. When I look at the Apostle Paul and God's grace, I think of a victory outreach kind of person. I think of a person like somebody that's risen up in our ministry. People that were, at least I could say for myself, a nobody. People that, that, that didn't have a future. They didn't have a destiny or a purpose. They didn't have direction. I was that guy. I was that guy that, that didn't have a purpose. They didn't have a destiny. I, what, what was my purpose? What was my destiny? Sitting on the couch? Come on, somebody. Man, I never thought in a million years I would travel to another country. This is a testimony. When I think of God's grace and what it does in our lives, I think of how it empowers us to make good decisions. How it motivates us to stay in his will. That's why we have to have a burden to do God's work, not make God's work the burden. We have to have a heart for God's work. That we shouldn't treat it like a nine to five. Come on, somebody. I feel in my heart like sometimes we make things familiar. Like worship. Like ushering, like children's ministry. That it's something that's just familiar to us. 
that it's something that we just do. We just clock in and clock out a nine to five. But the work of the Lord is not a nine to five. It's a burden in our hearts. There's a scripture in Ephesians chapter two. And it says, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Which God prepared in advance for us to do. So why, so why do we treat God's work as a burden? Why do we treat it like a nine to five? If God's grace empowers us to do his work. Then are we really living by grace? Or we are, or are we enslaved to something? Because when you look at the great, when you look at grace and the law, the law meant that you were a slave to what? Sin. And grace means what? Freedom. Grace means what? The empowerment to do God's will. The motivation to understand that you're doing this for not yourself, but for others. But so that people could see God's glory, so that they could encounter his grace and mercy, so that they could see supernatural things take place within their own lives, so that others can encounter his grace. It takes a people that are clothed in maturity, that lock arms one by one, that understand, I'm not in this for myself. It doesn't matter what I go through. It doesn't matter what kind of hurt may come my way. I'm going to continue this race. I'm going to continue to walk a life for God, to walk this journey of faith, because I know that it's not for my benefit. It, but it's for somebody else's benefit. It is the driving force that moves the non-believer into fellowship with God's Holy Spirit. It's the embodiment and fulfillment of Christ's selflessness and a determined heart that made the cross a symbol of grace and acceptance. It's the key to freedom, my friends, and the reason for our faith. That Christ died and rose and lives for us, that we can live in him and abide in his presence. His grace is perfect love. Oh, man. I'm breaking you off something tonight. Because it's something that I've come to understand. I've come to understand God's grace for my life. I don't deserve to be here. I don't deserve to be up here. I don't deserve it. There are times in my life that I could have died. They're like, oh, James, what kind of life did you live? Right. It couldn't have been that bad. Well, you weren't there. <laughs> Trust me, got bad. But perfect love brings obedience. Perfect love brings obedience. It's not a, I have to. Oh, I have to preach. Oh, I have to be on the worship this week. Oh, I have to be in the children's ministry. No, it's I get to. It's a privilege. I get to preach. I, I, I can't stand it when people tell me that. Oh, I have to do this this week. No, you get to, bro. You get to because it's God's grace upon your life. Why? Because you shouldn't be in that position. You shouldn't be leading those people. You shouldn't be there. But God's grace and his mercy is on your life. It's God's grace that empowers you to do good works. It's God's grace that tells you to say no to sin. That's my second point. That God's grace convicts us of sinfulness. I feel like this preaching is like a different style than what I'm used to. Because it's more of like a, I just want to scream and shout. It's Friday Night Live. I want to be excited. I want to jump up and down. I want to shout for Jesus. Come on, Albert, help me out. God's grace convicts us of sinfulness. It brings conviction through the Holy Spirit. It's a guide to repentance. Come on, somebody. God's grace is a guide to repentance. It doesn't push us away from God. You know what pushes us away from God is condemnation. When we feel pushed away from God, that's condemnation. That's what the devil puts in our minds. It's the thoughts of unworthiness and incapability. Romans 8, 1 through 4 says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death, which means God's grace can give you freedom from sin. God's grace can give you freedom from the things of this world. 
That's God's grace. It's awfully quiet in here. I must be hitting home. Hallelujah. <laughs> Man, have you ever felt God's grace before? Have you ever felt the love of God before? I think about it in my own life. That there are times where I stepped into a vehicle I shouldn't have. But I came out okay because God's grace was in my life. Under the influence, praying to God. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. I'm, I'm the only one. When you were ODing in that bathroom, you were shouting to the Lord. Come on, somebody. You're like, Lord, please get me out of this one. If I could come out of this one, I'll serve you for life. You go out of the hospital, they give you your Narcan, and then you go back to the streets to do the same thing. Hallelujah. But there was a breaking point within all of our lives where God's grace brought effectiveness. Where that we, got, we came to the end of ourselves. Come on, somebody. Maybe I'm just preaching to myself, but I know that I came to that place. And God reminded me of it recently. That you're not just a person that was put here for no reason. But God has called you to make an impact. Oh, that there'd be a people that would rise up. There would be a people that would take responsibility for their generation. That there'd be a people that understood God's grace upon their lives. How much God loves them and cares for them. How much God wants to see them successful. Not just in ministry, but in life. How God wants to see them go from level to level. From glory to glory. From grace to grace. How he wants to see them go into certain places. Like the UTC. Like the third wave campus. How God wants to see people raise up and become pastors and ministers and evangelists. How, they want, how he wants to to see them preaching on the streets, preaching on the gospel. You know, I, I had an opportunity to preach in my own workplace. I don't force my way in there. But when God opens up a door for communication of the gospel to be done in your workplace, man, I can't say no. I can't say no. Oh, you used to go to church? That's my door. Like, what church did you go to? Oh, I went to this church. You know? And then I start giving them my testimony. And I start breaking bread with them. It was just me and another employee. And, and, and he had, you know, this background with, with, with the, the Mormon church and stuff. And I was just like, wow, it's crazy. And then he started asking me questions. And then we started having a Bible study right there, folding wontons. Come on, somebody. We started having a Bible study right there. About, about Jesus Christ and, and how we needed God. We needed Jesus. I'll share with you what I shared with him. How our sin was so great that no man could fulfill the law of God. His law was so perfect and so pure that no sinful man could fulfill it. So God chose to bring himself down in flesh so that he could fulfill the law so that man didn't have to. Because it was impossible for flesh to fulfill the law. So God himself became a man. Does it sound simple to you? Well, it blew his mind. Hallelujah. It blew his mind. He was like, what? Dang, bro, you're blowing my mind right now. And now it, 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 it sounds simple to Christians. But to people that don't have that understanding, they're like, whoa. That's crazy. Tell me more. What about this Jesus? What about him? Well, how did he live? What, what, how do I be like Jesus? And we're right there, breaking bread with each other. And it reminded me, man. And it reminded me about what God has done in my life. How far he's taken me. That's what God's grace does. It reminds you of God's faithfulness. In Lamentations 3, 22 through 23, it says, Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail, and they're new every morning. Great. Is your faithfulness. God is faithful to us. Even when we're not faithful to him. Even when we. When we don't acknowledge him. Man God put a deep conviction in my heart. Throughout the week because. It's so easy to forget about God throughout the day to day. When you're so busy with your activities. 
when you're so busy throughout your, your daily life. When you're in the routine of things. And I was at, at the restaurant that I work at. I was like, man, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for not thinking of you. Even when I'm doing this. Even when I'm doing this right now, I'm not thinking of you. Sorry. And you know what? You're not perfect. We're not perfect people. But does that thought even cross our minds? Because God is real. God is real. Man, I'll never forget Wednesday because the testimony of that of that pastor's wife, Maria. That was man, that was gratefulness and, and purity, man. That was gratefulness and purity. When I when I heard her cry out, I was like, wow. And it was just over and over again throughout the week that God has just been putting it on my heart, like, man, maybe we need to repent. Maybe we need to ask the Lord for forgiveness. Because we haven't been as close as we we should with him. I, I feel a revival stirring <laughs> within people that haven't been getting a hold of God like they should. Because I was that person. I was that person. I feel something stirring up in the spirit. You don't have to clap. Just participate. Participate in it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you did yesterday, even how you felt yesterday. But it's about what you do right now. That's why God was reminding me of his grace. That's why God was, and, and, and pastor spoke that word on time. It's crazy how God works, right? If you didn't hear it on Sunday, look it up on YouTube. Listen to it on our Facebook page. Because God's grace changes everything. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> Man, God's grace changes everything. His grace is power, folks. He wants us to be like him. How can we be like him if he's not in us? How can we give the mercy and grace that he's given to us, to others, if he's not in us? That's why we need the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our partner in the faith. He beckons our hearts and speaks to us on the behalf of others. He nudges us to do what's uncomfortable and leads us into the wilderness to triumph and victory over the enemy. When Jesus was led into the wilderness, he was led in the spirit. But he had victory afterwards. He had victory. He gives us comfort in times of heartache and gives us strength when we're weak and unable to move forward, as I call the piano thieves. We need God's Holy Spirit, church. God's perfect grace and his Holy Spirit work hand in hand to produce the glory of God in our lives and to show us that to live a godly life is possible in this fallen world. There must be a desire within us to seek his face. There must be a desire within us to want more of him. It's not just based off the faith of one person. It's not just pastor's faith. We can hold on to it. Oh, yeah, we can ride by it. We can live by his faith. But we need faith of our own. Imagine the collective faith of a multitude. A people that understand the same vision. That speak the same language. That aren't striving with one another. Or creating strife. But a people that love each other talking to my brother Matt about uh, about how when Jesus came to Peter and he asked him Peter do you love me he said Peter do you agape me and Peter responded Jesus of course you know that I love you but he said 
I phileo you. I think pastor spoke a message on this. He spoke a message on this. And it reminded me of that. And he asked him again. He said, Jesus, do you love me? Do you agape? Or uh, Peter, do you love me? Do you agape me? And, and Peter, he responded, Jesus, you know I love you. I phileo you. I phileo love you. And those are Greek words. Agape means love that's unconditional. It doesn't harbor any grudge or that regardless of someone's condition, circumstance, situation, or even the feelings that they have towards you, agape is unconditional love. It's the kind of love that God gives. And Peter's love, said when he said phileo, it was just a brotherly love. That's the kind of love that we have to have for one another. Or at least strive to, strive to have it. Is that agape love? Yeah. Is that love? You know, I love you, man. No matter what you do. You know, there was somebody that, you know, in my heart, that because I experienced unforgiveness, you know, I experienced it, and it was hard for me to get over it. But because I was at a in, in a place in my heart where I was embittered, and there was a seed of bitterness within me, I was unable to feel God's grace on my life. Isn't that wild? Because there was bitterness within my heart, because there was something rooted within my heart, I was unable to receive God's forgiveness. Couldn't get a hold of God couldn't my spiritual life was broken I was dying spiritually and God delivered me from that hate he delivered me from it but but here's the thing I had to ask for that deliverance I had to seek God for that deliverance he didn't just give it to me he knew I needed it he knew I needed it because he's seen me in my condition. And I could feel it when I got delivered, how God's heart broke for me. You know? And God's heart breaks for each and every one of his children. When you're in pain, when you're hurt, when you're mistreated, when you're unjustly accused, when, 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 when someone speaks badly about you, or when God, God feels that. Why? Because you're a representative of who he is. And you're his child. Wouldn't you be upset if somebody was hurting your child? Of course he gets mad. He gets angry. Psalms 18 talks about how when David was in trouble that God hopped on an angel and flew down to rescue him. God himself, he put on his armor. He brandished his spear and his javelin. You know he does the same thing for you and I when we're going through things. But the problem is, is that we don't ask him. We don't talk to him. We don't ask God. Man, I cried out to God. I cried out to him. I said, God, take this from me. I don't want to live like this, God. I can't do it anymore. And he answered me. <laughs> God is a faithful God. And his grace is abundant upon your life. If there's a, something that you're going through, you have to cry out to God. If there's a, a hurt in your life that's hidden in your heart and you're not showing it to people, you're not confessing it to somebody else, I want to let you know tonight that, that God can do something with it. He can turn your messed up situation into a message. Come on, somebody. That's what he's doing here with me. I don't usually preach like this. I don't. But I feel like somebody needs to hear it, man. Like, like there needs to be a time of separation time of repentance where we come to God and we come clean and say God I'm I know I'm wicked I know I'm a sinner Lord have mercy on me I know your grace is sufficient for my life but I right now I want to be close to you God that's what God wants he wants fellowship he wants closeness with his people as we all stand he wants closeness
And if you feel like you're not good enough for that, that kind of glory to fall upon your life, you're wrong. God wants to bring the glory of heaven upon your life. He wants to show you his goodness. He wants to show you his favor. He wants to show you his love, his presence. He wants to give it all to you. He wants to give it to you freely. But we got to come to God with an open heart. We got to come to God clean. We say, God, Lord, cleanse me of my sins. I want to be, Lord, righteous. I want to be one with you, Lord. I want to be one with your spirit. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, lift up your hands all over this place. And let's just worship the Lord. Spirit, you are welcome. Come for love. altar to you tonight if that's you man you want to you want to be close to God it takes us just removing everything from ourselves saying Lord cleanse me of this whatever it is I came in with Lord, cleanse me of it I want to be free from it but you can't stay the same you can't just come to the altar and feel good and then and then leave the same you gotta you gotta do something with it so if that's you, I want you to come to the altar and just repent. Just seek the Lord. Seek his face tonight. you in this place, oh Lord. Oh, we worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. Oh, we worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord.
the peace of the Lord is in this place. Oh God, we exalt you in this place, oh Lord. God, we give you honor, we give you glory, Lord. We give you praise, we give you glory, Lord Jesus. We give you all the exaltation, Jesus. Oh, you're worthy, Lord, you're worthy. never given your life to the Lord, I want to throw out this invitation to you tonight. And maybe you say, man, I, I want it. I want that. I want that grace. You say you want to change within your own life. God can do it. We consistently walk with him. We consistently seek his face. It doesn't happen overnight. You've heard it said tons of times that it's not just a spiritual door that you walk through. And then all of a sudden you're sanctified and that you're walking on a cloud. That's not how it works. But it's a lifetime of choices. Choosing to choose God every day. That's a daily choice. Man, I choose God today. Sometimes that's a victory. Like, oh man, today I choose God. That's a victory for some of us. I'm right there. But you say that within yourself. You say, man, I want God's grace like that. I want to be empowered. I want you to repeat this prayer after me. If that's you, you don't have to come up here. But repeat, repeat this prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus. Tonight, I acknowledge you. I did it in the past, but tonight I acknowledge you. Who you are as my Savior. How you saved countless other people. And Lord, I ask that you cover me with the blood. That you forgive me of my sins. That you turn my life around. Lord, I pray that you would do something supernatural within my life. Breathe a fresh anointing. Breathe a new start. A new chapter. In Jesus' mighty name. Let me pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I just come before you tonight, Lord God. Lord, I pray for those that, that prayed that prayer, and Lord, I also pray that Lord, you would, Lord, renew, Lord God, and pour out, Lord, a, a brand new thing, Lord God. Lord, a fresh anointing, Lord God, a fresh fire, a fresh seal, Father God, upon our lives, Lord Jesus. Oh God, a new hunger, my God, a new desire, Father God. That we wouldn't let, Lord God, the things that we do for you become familiar, Father God. But that we would have the burden, Lord God. The burden of the vision, Lord Jesus, the burden, Lord God, of Lord, what you desire to do within our lives, Lord, that we wouldn't forget, my God, Lord, that you paid a heavy price for us, Lord Jesus. And that your grace, Lord God, though it abounds within our lives, Lord Jesus, we don't want to take it for granted, my God. Empower us, Lord Jesus, to do your will, Father God. Lord, give us conviction, my God. Lord, deep conviction, my God. And remind us of your faithfulness, God. In Jesus' mighty name. continue to worship the Lord just a little longer. God, we exalt you, Jesus.
worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. You're a holy God. You're a holy king, Lord. You're a righteous God. You're a righteous Savior, Lord Jesus. You're strong and mighty. You're strong and mighty, Lord. You're strong and mighty. You're strong and mighty, Lord. Strong and mighty, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, we choose to honor you tonight, Lord. God, with our thanksgiving, Lord, with our praise, oh, Jesus. We choose to give you glory tonight, oh, God. You're worthy, Lord. You're worthy, Lord. You're worthy, Lord. You're worthy, Lord. Father, I pray that you seal this message, Lord, within our hearts, Lord God, and that you continue, Father, to move in a supernatural way, Lord, within each and every one of our lives, Lord God. Oh, God, we, wanna, we don't want to take lightly, Lord God, what you've done tonight, Lord Jesus. Lord, we want to take it home with us, Lord Jesus. We want to bring, Lord God, the atmosphere of heaven into our own homes, Lord God. The environment of heaven, Lord Jesus, we want to bring it with us, God. Oh, in Jesus' mighty name, Lord God, I pray that you would continue, Father God, to guide us, Lord, to lead us, Lord, to let us walk in love, Lord God, with one another, Father God, and journey this journey of faith, Lord God. Oh, Father, with a determination and with a fire, Lord Jesus, in Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Come on, somebody give God some praise in this place. Come on, somebody give him some praise. Hallelujah. With that, you can consider yourself dismissed. And also, there's some, uh, they're having a benefit for the kids gang, so go ahead and uh, donate and get some strawberry shortcakes, amen.